This is how we used to turn things on or off. With what was once a simple toggle, today has turned into this. Real-time physics simulations, glass refractions with realistic chromatic aberration, animated 3D icons, spring interactions before everything we touch. We are finally out of the boring and minimal flat design. But I'm sorry, as cool as all this looks, what this shows us is that the user interfaces that we've been using for the past 40 years are dead. The same companies that are studying the laws of physics to make a toggle are simultaneously trying to get rid of UI entirely and replace it with this plain black and white walls of AI text, which finally enough looks exactly the same as a command line. The thing that came before graphical user interfaces. And while all the attention is on the shiny glass, behind the scenes, we are going back to the drawing board to build how the future of interacting with technology is gonna look like. See, there are three levels to how the future of UI is playing out. And we're about to get to level two right now. And all of this is happening in the exact same way it happened for our graphical user interfaces 40 years ago. I'm Enrico and on this channel, I go behind the scenes of the design, engineering and psychology of the tech we use every day. But to understand what's going on, we need to start from this. This is something that we do billions of times a day. This thing, pulling down a page to refresh it. This gesture was invented by this guy, Lauren Brichter, back in 2008 for his Twitter app called Tweety. And it's an example of what true UI innovation looks like. Back in 1995, the start menu was a UI innovation. The Mac OS dock in 2001, which magnifies as you hover over it to fit more stuff. Or dragging around to explore a map in Google Maps instead of clicking arrows to move around. These things look normal, but they were innovations. I mean, just look at the crowd reactions when Steve Jobs demoed the slide to unlock for the first iPhone. Phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. Right? You want to see that again? And all of these things are here. This is the curve for how all technological innovation works, the S curve. But today we are here. We're hitting the ceiling. But if you really look behind all the, well, glass, this is really still this. It works in the exact same way. First, it was flat, then it was glassy, then it was flat again, and now it's glassy again. This is exactly how technology works. If you take smartphones, for example, we've also been in this phase for some years now. But the cool thing about the S-curve is that at the end of one, there's always another one that starts. Take a look at this. This is Google Slides and this is PowerPoint, tools to make presentations that have been around for a super long time. And over time, the UI became cleaner and cleaner, easier to use, more refined, with some hiccups along the way, sure. But now, after 30 years of refinement, every feature is there. The clicks to reach each place are minimized. We perfected this UI to the extreme. But now something interesting is happening. In the last few months, my friends that work in consulting or that have to make slides for a living keep asking me what are the new tools or ways that there are to not have to use this seemingly perfect UI. And after telling them that they should probably quit consulting, I showed them some of the new tools that allow you to generate presentations and slides, and now they are hooked. It's as if this clicking around on these perfectly refined interfaces immediately felt like a thing of the past. We spent decades making user interfaces perfect, minimizing clicks, making them usable, making them beautiful, intuitive, and now what everyone wants to do is to avoid them entirely. People have stopped reading articles on these websites filled with ads and banners and cookie pop-ups and SEO slop, and they prefer to just use ChatGPT or Perplexity to just get the information. But what if it's not just the bad UI, but all of UI that's gonna be replaced? Well, this is kind of what's happening. But the way tech companies have been approaching this so far is, well, take a look at this demo from Amazon's new AI-powered Alexa. I noticed a birthday party conflicts with picking up grandma at the airport. Want me to book her a ride? Technically, Alexa has always been powered by AI, but bear with me for a second. Now, I can tell you already that while this looks cool and futuristic, no human would ever use this thing. Why? How does your friend know which car is coming? Is an Uber actually going to show up? When? What if the flight is late? How much did you even pay for this ride? What if there's some traffic? Who's gonna contact you in case of an emergency? It's the exact same problem that we are seeing in demos like this. This is $28 online. Great. Buy it. Now tell me, if you need to buy something, would you rather do it like this? Alexa, I need to buy a tungsten cube. First result is tungsten cube 1 centimeter x1 comax 1 cm heavy object. Or just see this. User interfaces are great at output, at showing things to you, like your presentation or the options for your Uber ride with prices and time estimates and information, and they're all visually laid out. But they suck at input. You need to scroll through menus and toggles and finding everything in some obscure panel. Today's chatbots and voice assistants 
assistants, on the other hand, are amazing at input. You can ramble to ChatGPT in voice mode or write some malformed prompt, and it's really good at understanding what you want. But they suck at output, at actually showing you information, making you feel in control. Now, this is gonna be evil. Next time you go to a friend's house, try to say, Alexa, add a MacBook Pro M4 Max 16 inch to the cart. You're gonna see their heart sink as Alexa tries to randomly add a $4,000 plus dollar Mac to their cart and is ready to check out. And if you have an Alexa and you're watching this video without headphones, you might having that feeling right now. See, text obsession with this idea of the omniscient chatbot is not new. Take a look at this. This is a demo from General Magic in 1998. Look up Kevin Kramer. Let me check. Kevin Kramer. The company name is Adventure Dynamics. And this is the same vision that was supposed to make Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant the future of interacting with technology. But it never happened. We now have this new wave of chatbots and assistants that are taking over the world. In just three years, ChatGPT went from nothing to getting 2.5 billion prompts to it every single day. It's the fastest growing tech product ever. And these feel magical because finally they have solved the input problem. They made it human. But if you look at the output, we went back to how command lines used to look back in the 1980s. Just black and white walls of text. But finally, we're starting to see something new happening. The start of a new S-curve. There are three levels that we are already seeing to this new post UI world. And I've been using level one stuff for a while now, and there are the first demos and experimental projects of level two already. And believe me, after trying some of these, this is gonna feel like the old world really, really soon. While Apple or Google were busy perfecting glass checkboxes or doing yet another redesign of the quick settings panel, quietly, we are starting to see small companies, individual designers and engineers build the next phase. It's exactly what happened in the 1980s for the graphical user interface. This is me in front of a boring and unassuming building next to some wheat fields. Well, this place is Xerox Park, and it's where the graphical user interface was invented back in the late 70s, only for a young Steve Jobs who lived just 20 minutes away to go there, see what they're up to, and then take all of their ideas and make them mainstream. First in the Apple Lisa, and then more famously with the original Mac. And this is exactly what's happening right now. Take a look at this. This is PostHog. It's the tool that I've been using to check the analytics and product usage of my startup. Now, what usually happens with these tools is that you spend an enormous amount of time creating charts and dashboards and visualization. Duplicate this, add a filter there. But then I noticed this icon and it popped up a sidebar that let me take actions directly by just typing. I was a bit skeptical because the last time something this happened, it was clippy. But I decided to give it a try anyways. And within two prompts, it built for me what would have taken me 10 minutes of fiddling with this actually pretty well done UI. I thought, okay, that's cool. But then I went back a second time to create another chart and I immediately felt drawn to clicking that icon again. And again, and again, I was starting to have that, oh shit moment. And this is not something that is coming in the future. This is level one and it's happening right now. Cursor did the same thing for coding chat on the right and the app to the left. Dear browser, same thing, chat on the right, page on the left. But talking about the browser, this is Comet by Perplexity, a new kind of browser that is currently under limited access, but that allows you to take actions via chat on your web pages. Again, same UI. Now the products that you can use today that do this chat plus UI thing in a really actually useful way are still very few. But once you try them and it clicks, you naturally find yourself using the graphical user interface less and less. You slowly resize the chat window to be a little bigger and then a little bigger. It's literally the old world and new world side by side and the new world is getting bigger. But this is still level one. It still does feel like a chatbot. So what if we take the old world of UI and the new world of AI, we don't put them side by side, but we start to merge them together. But one of the products that does feel magical when you use it is Bolt.new, the sponsor of this video. See, I've never been able to find an app that tracks my finances exactly how I want it. So I'm just gonna build it. With Bolt, I can build a fully functional expense tracking app with user authentication, a real database, and it took me two minutes. And it's not a mock-up, it's a real working app live on the internet. And this is not only useful for building apps, iterating on a user interface or trying a different layout or different design, it's much easier because it just takes a few minutes to do it. You don't even need to design it. I can literally type, build me a project management tool with Kanban boards and boom. You can prompt it to add accepting payments with tools like Stripe or store your user's data in a real database. We've all had that idea for an app or a product or a website. And now instead of saying, where do I begin? You can just start building. 
what a few years ago would have taken a team of 10 people a few months, now you can do it in minutes. You can try it out for free today. Just go to Bolt.new and start building something real. Take a look at this. This is Todoist. It's a fairly popular to-do app, but they are working on this experimental feature called Ramble. You have this Ramble button, and once you click it, you can start to dictate natural language commands, not to a chatbot, but to the existing Todoist UI. It's not the typical back and forth of the chatbot, because here the UI we have gotten used to is still there to guide you. It gives you real-time feedback and output what graphical user interfaces do best. Now, Todoist is a very simple to-do app, and this is still an experimental feature, but it's the seed for something incredibly powerful. Because imagine how this would look like in a complex app, like Premiere Pro to edit videos or Photoshop. Eventually, you might not need all these other buttons right here, and you'd be increasingly more drawn to just one button, the Ramble button. And here at level two is where I think we'll start to see the real mainstream adoption of this. Why do I say that? Well, because of this. This is me in San Francisco, trying a self-driving robot taxi from Waymo for the first time. It did feel futuristic, but what helped me feel at ease is the fact that while it was driving itself through the streets, that was still a regular car with a steering wheel that moved and pedals that moved. I felt in control somehow. And it's the same thing that is happening here. The chatbots that we have today feel more similar to this Amazon self-driving car, which has no pedals, no steering wheel. It feels much more strange, much more foreign and unfamiliar. So having the familiar UI behind this is what makes this so immediately accessible for everyone. Now, there are still issues for building products like this. The CEO of Todoist shared that this feature has some insane costs right now because the AI processing is very expensive, but I still think that we'll see that happening sooner than you think. I am building my own product right now, my old startup. It's called Flask and it's a feedback and collaboration tool for video. But as I'm seeing what's possible with this new kind of ramble buttons, I've always had that question in the back of my mind. This is really cool, but am I still building for the old world of UI? That's why I started to work on my own experimental project, where I replace all my UI with just one button, and you just share your feedback and speak freely, and the app will then do everything and update the app and the UI in real time and position everything in the right place. But while level 1 and level 2 are here, in this new S-curve that we are starting to see, level 3 Free feels like it's here. Take a look at this demo. We are using prompts to ask something, but it returns back to us a user interface that we can interact with, and it's created on the fly every single time. We will not be building interfaces anymore. We'll be building interface generators. Instead of using Skyscanner's UI to fiddle through menus and pop-ups to create my complex flight search or dictate it, I can just type what I need, but the output is not a chatbot. It's a user interface that gets built on the spot for the type of search that I make. This is Eric Schmidt, ex-CEO of Google, and he's already talking about this. I think user interfaces are largely going to go away mm -hmm. because if you think about it, the agents speak English, typically, yep. or yep. other languages. You can talk to them. You can say what you want. The UI can be generated. So I can say, generate me a, a set of buttons that allows me to solve this problem, and it's generated for you. Today, we design products like this, with flows of pixel-perfect screens. But in this new world, this is gone. There are no screens. There's just capturing the user's intent and generating a UI on the fly for the user. And this doesn't mean that designers will disappear. They will just go from drawing rectangles in Figma to writing rules, teaching AI when to show a calendar versus a list, when you need a map versus a form. It's like the difference between painting every frame of a movie versus writing the script and letting the actors perform. Now, this might still take a while, because what happens when the UI you generate is wrong? How do you maintain consistency? Or what about that muscle memory that we all have for where buttons are supposed to be? And I know that right now you have so many questions and concerns, but in 1984, people had the same concerns about graphical user interfaces. How will people remember where they save their files without typing the exact path on the command line? What if they click on the wrong icon? Turns out, people figured it out pretty fast. But as we move towards this new post UI world, there's something else that you might have noticed about the product you use today, which is that somehow the more popular something becomes, the worse it gets. Well, there's a very specific reason why, and it's this, the law of the marginal user. And you can learn all about it in this video right here. I'm Enrico, and I'll see you in the next one.